How do you like my shirt? I look like an angry gondolier. Ugh. Hello and good day to you all. Welcome back to the Sobich Estate for another intellectually provocative entry into my commonplace video vlog. This week, silhouetted against my glorious record collection, uh, we are going to be talking about Philip Sidney, and in particular, Philip Sidney's defense of poesy. Finally, someone's defending poetry and arts. It's exciting. Quick bit of historical context. Philip Sidney was one of the super courtiers we mentioned before when we were talking about corporations and the proliferation of English literature, and English literature gaining an entirely new significance and influence over other parts of the world, and it leaving the isolated little existence it once led, thanks to the courtiers, thanks to the courtiers opening up these new channels of communication. In the defense of poesy is believed to be a response to a guy by the name of Stephen Gawson. He was a Puritan pamphleteer who basically put out a pamphlet called The School of Abuse, which uh, basically blamed theaters, uh, playwrights, and specifically poets for contributing to the moral decay of English society. And to add insult to injury, he actually dedicated his pamphlet, School of Abuse, to Philip Sidney without uh, consulting with him beforehand. And in defense of poesy, Sidney sort of takes back poetry's legitimacy, in a sense. He proclaims poetry's legitimacy in the most charismatic fashion possible. First of all, he talks about how every form of education, be you, a, a, be you someone who studies geometry, a philosopher, a historian, a mathematician, a musician, everything of these professions and educational backgrounds is severely indebted to poetry. Well, he starts right off by saying, and first, truly to all them that professing learning inveigh against poetry may justly be objected that they go very near to ungratefulness to seek to deface that which in the noble nations and languages that are known hath been the first light giver to ignorance and first nurse whose milk little and little enabled them to feed afterward of tougher knowledges. So it was, it was almost like a mother figure. A very interesting device that he uses here. It's almost as if these educated men who are slagging off poetry, who are criticizing poetry, are, it's, they're almost like ungrateful teenagers to their parents, really. The parent being poetry, who has suckled them and nourished them, and allowed them to attain greater feats of intellectual daring do and prowess. In addition to being the foundation of basically all modern knowledge and academic discipline, poetry essentially has this transcendent quality that that Sidney is trying to get across here. He talks about how, well, if you're, if you're into geometry or something, you abide by certain laws, as do philosophers, as do historians, as do mathematicians who exist within numbers and, fa numbers and figures and things like that, or musicians who are confined to the notes on the page. They, they have to obey some sort, of, some sort of rules or regulations having to do within, their, within the context of their discipline. On the other hand, with poets, poets essentially make their own rules. They're not governed by any of these rules. They basically construct and shape reality as they see fit and as they feel, which kind of adds to the idea of poetry being a transcendent thing. But at the same time, it's also a bit of a get-out clause to all of the poetry naysayers who, who blame it for the moral decay of uh, English society. As we saw with John Donne's The Flea and Women's Constancy a short while back, poets create a topos, a place from which they're able to frame their arguments and unleash their rhetorical, convincing... Poets find a... To poets find a... Poets are able to create a topos from which they're able to unleash their rhetorical arguments upon the subject. They're able to find a place, a sphere of resistance, if you will, where they're able to do this from. And so, Sidney is basically arguing that poets essentially do the same thing. Poets are only seeking to portray reality, to produce a speaking picture, as he calls it. The poet, he beginneth not with obscure definitions which must blur the margin with interpretations and load the memory with doubtfulness, but he cometh to you with words set in delightful proportion, either accompanied with or prepared for the sweet, enchanting skill of music, and with a tale forsooth he cometh on to you, with a tale which haldeth children from play, and old men from the churn from the chimney corner, and pretending no more, doth intend the winning of the mind from wickedness to virtue. Even despite the representations, while they must that while they might represent wickedness or wicked things or immorality or provide depictions of this type of thing, at the same time 
there's an idea that it's all a didactic device. It's it's all metaphor. It's all representation designed to win people over from wickedness, to allow them to see their follies, to allow them to see the, the results, the products of a certain type of lifestyle, to allow them to win their minds over from wickedness to virtue, as he said. He said, the, the poet he nothing affirms and therefore never lieth. So in not really affirming which is technically the right way to live one's life or which is the general path to take, he never gives voice to anything anything definite or concrete. He just presents the picture. They just present a representation. And therefore, they're never lying. They're never not telling the truth. Basically, the onus appears on the reader, in this sense, to, to determine which is true, which is, which is falsehood. So in disassociating yourself from your, from your own ideas and from the rhetoric or from the content, and providing yourself with a topos or shelter for these ideas, while not presenting yourself as a, a, a realistic target or an actual target for monarchy or church institutions, you're sort of disseminating these ideas. You're free to disseminate these ideas and spread them around this, industri this increasingly industrialized printing industry and literary industry. And the increase, as we said before, of the reading public who are now picking up and consuming these ideas. And it's something that, can, that has the incredible potential of revolution to undermine really these established power structures. These institutions through King James or these, these other monarchic writings that have tried to try to basically represent government as the, the body of the people, the governing body, and have tried to make people subject to their messages. Well, here is poesy or, or poetry or theater at the time basically expressing Basically, finding ways around these structures, finding ways around these rhetorical, these these suppressive rhetorical devices that have been set in place for so long to subject people. Now it's almost these ideas are being put out there, and it's basically up to the people whether or not they receive them or not. So everything is sort of coming together right now in defense of poesy. It really it really brings together a lot of these these main issues that we've been wrestling with over the course of the course. And so in defense of poesy. It functions as not only a, an affirmation of the incredible usefulness and the undeniable influence of poetry over all knowledge and language structures, but it's also a kind of get-out clause for poetry, where poets can disassociate themselves from their works, and poetry doesn't really attain any sort of moral responsibility for leading people in one direction or another. It is not a reflection of morality. It's only entertainment.